uh, we have a session which is mostly centered to part of it is technical aspects, but I think it's very, very useful to have also an overview of how experiments are being done and what's the work behind the measurement, which looks kind of simple. Okay, one measures the atomic transition, but uh, behind that there is a huge amount of work which brings us to uh, measure some something which is so, so, so difficult. And part of these talks of this morning session are centered so on uh, uh, some uh, important technical aspects and some other are again projecting towards the future. We have these uh, two last talks which are uh, going to show us what's the future of this field if one thinks about ultra high precision measurements when this is necessary. So we have uh, five speakers in this session. I ask the speakers to stay. They have all together 25 minutes. So if they can uh, do the talk within 22 minutes, then we have three minutes for questions and answers. So I invite the first speaker who is the Spider-Man, Marco Milucci, who is hanging on the ceiling of Daphne. You see him in his background. He will give us an overview of what happens now with more details on the technical part of Sidartino. So what are the aims and what is going on right now in Daphne? So Marco, please, the floor is all yours. Okay, thank you. The ceiling is all yours, yes. And uh, okay. So, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Marco Milucci. I'm a researcher of the Siddhartha 2 collaboration. And as the title suggests, in this presentation, I will discuss about Siddhartino, which is the first step towards Siddhartha 2. In detail, I will give you some uh, detail about the um, uh, experimental apparatus and I will describe our activities. As you know, maybe already, is, uh, as you already know, maybe Siddhartha is an international collaboration which involves several institutes spread over the world. And uh, uh, we are uh, in business here in uh, Frascati at the Daphne Collider. Be why the Daphne Collider? Because uh, it's unique in the world since it provides a monochromatic and low energy K minus beam. And uh, uh, these uh, uh, characteristics uh, are very suitable to perform the chaotic atoms spectroscopy. And uh, uh, so we um, are um, here ready and uh, with the Siddhartino setup. But speaking in general, uh, the Siddhartha 2 experimental apparatus is this one that I'm showing you here in this drawing. And here we have a Veto 1 uh, um, system, which is made by L shaped. Uh, um, classic scintillators, and this is uh, um, the, 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 the installation of this uh, veto is for the rejection of the hadronic background, so the uh, interaction of the nuclei, the chi manus with the nuclei of the target. The target cell is uh, here in the middle of the setup. It's made by uh, aluminum and uh, mylar captain, and it's surrounded by our uh, main uh, important uh, detectors, which are the SDDs, because these are the tools, the device, uh, which have to detect uh, the transition of the chaotic uh, atoms. Here we have uh, all the uh, part of the SDDs placed around the target cell, so you have to imagine that this is completely surrounded. And going outside the, um, the system, we have uh, two, two uh, um, system of uh, plastic scintillators. We have the luminometer, which is on the lateral side of the beam pipe, which measure, as you know, the uh, luminosity of the beam. And we have the count trigger, which is up and down with respect to the uh, beam pipe. And it works uh, uh, for the uh, trigger, for triggering the, uh, the signals uh, to be detected by the SDDs. Uh, as you know, all this setup uh, has been uh, already uh, um, optimized by uh, some Monte Carlo simulation, and the uh, final results of this uh, simulation says that we not only we are ready to perform, we, we can perform uh, the measurement of the chaotic deuterium, which uh, I remember has an, uh, um, a yield which is at least uh, 10 times lower 
with respect to the Kaonic Hydrogen One, which uh, has been performed by Siddhartha in 2009, and uh, actually still the most precise measurement done uh, on the Kaonic Hydrogen. So we tried to do something more challenging, so to measure the Kaonic deuterium transition to the low to the fundamental levels with a yield with, which is one order um, of magnitude lower, but this simulation, which takes into account the full experimental apparatus, says that we can do this, and we can do with the same precision, with a comparable precision to the Siddhartha one. So uh, this is uh, the really first uh, image of the Siddhartino. The Siddhartha experiment is told. Actually, it's not Siddhartha, it's Siddhartino, because uh, uh, the Siddhartino aim is to measure the background. So going for step, uh, what is Siddhartino? Siddhartino is essentially uh, Siddhartha 2, okay, experimental apparatus, but with a reduced the number of, uh, um, of SDDs. Uh, here we have... Uh, the uh, the picture which shows exactly the uh, the setup and uh, you have to imagine that this is uh, the internal vacuum chamber of Siddhartha and we just have installed this uh, um, part this uh, this one in the yellow box which is a single bus uh, why because uh, in, the, in the first phase of the Siddhartha the Daphne um, uh, commissioning uh, when the machine is operating on the tuning of the beam is expected and we have measured and we have proved that the background and the SDDs and in general is very high very high because they are of course tuning the beam so we have a lot of showering effect or losing also the beam which can um, go also directly on the SDDs so to avoid uh, an, uh, damage uh, for a long period due to the, this radiation, which is uh, completely uh, meaningless to, to have these SDDs inside, for this reason, we decided to put uh, just uh, um, one-sixth of the, the, uh, the array. So you have to imagine that uh, because of this uh, risky, risk, uh, we already thought to Siddhartha as a, a modular experiment. We have uh, six parts. And uh, so we can install one, the, uh, this commissioning phase will be ended. We can install the remaining part quite easily because it's just a replication of the single bus we already installed. But we, what is the aim of uh, uh, Siddhartino? The Siddhartino is to uh, aim is to evaluate the machine background firstly. So we have the SDDs, we have the luminometer, we have the count trigger. And all these elements uh, are needed to evaluate uh, the uh, background of, uh, of the machine, and, uh, and I will discuss this uh, later. And at the end of this evaluation, when we are confident that the system is the, the, the machine is quite ready, we will start also with the measurement, and we are going to do this uh, with the measurement of the Kaonic uh, helium four, because we can in this way we can compare the uh, the results of our measurement with. Um, with this simulation that you show here. In this simulation, essentially, it's uh, uh, useful to say that we expect for, uh, um, for the measurement of the Kaonic uh, Helium-4 with the setup, uh, of the, with the Siddhartino setup, a uh, ratio signal over background of around uh, um, 10 to 2. This, is, uh, this uh, is estimated considering the background of the Siddhartha run in 2009. So that are, this is a condition, strong condition on the uh, requirements and the, the evaluation of the quality of the beams and background delivered by, by Daphne. So again, Siddhartino, as you see here, they, I used the same picture as before for Siddhartha do, but I just put uh, in a, in a uh, white square the, uh, the single bus because the, the main difference, for, the only difference is this one. And uh, we, as I told you, we um, installed Siddhartino because we were in a Daphne commissioning phase. We are not uh, ready, uh, they are not ready with the uh, beams to uh, optics for uh, the, the measurement of the Kaonic deuterium. But in the meantime, uh, we did a refined optimization during this phase of the main, the main important tools for the, the quality evaluation of the background which are the SDDs and the related front-end electronics, of course, and the luminometer. Uh, let's start with the, uh, with the SDDs. The SDDs are new technology of silicon drift detector in a, um, 
in a uh, ceramics of uh, in arrays of two by four metrics. And this is the is, has been developed by the LMF, Polytechnic of Milan and FBK, dedicated for the measurement for the high precision chaotic deuterium measure. Uh, and all the details uh, on the labora laboratory optimization and all the structure of uh, this, uh, this uh, detector will be given in the next talk, uh, just after to me, by my colleague Francesco Sgaramello. Let's move on the detectors already inside Daphne, so after the characterization, the optimization done in laboratory, here are a couple of, cap a couple of uh, photos. And here we have on the left uh, the detector already installed inside the Sidarkino uh, <coughs> setup. And uh, on the right, the preparation, where we put them in a head to head configuration to optimize the uh, geometrical efficiency. <coughs> As you told, in this time, uh, we uh, take advantage at some point of this, uh, uh, this condition of the, of the beam, which, is, which are very, which are worse. Uh, worse than what expected for the measurement measure, for the final measurement to test our electronics. Why? Because uh, we know for sure that uh, uh, this is the worst condition to, to test uh, our energy, energy response of the SDDs. So we did uh, like this. We put an X-ray tube below the target cell, of course, outside the vacuum chamber, with a multi-elemental target made by titanium, uh, iron, copper, bromine, and strontium. In such a way, we cover all the the energy range of the of the um, of the SDDs, and we did a study of uh, the energy response uh, in uh, this heavy background condition, which made by high, ener high energy particle radiation, also directly dire uh, directly hitting on the on the SDDs. These are the, the results. Uh, here you see here clearly the uh, five peaks. Uh, the, 10 peaks, so it's K alpha and K bit of the five, five elements. This is an example of a single unit. We had this spectra, we made a fit, calibrated, and then we extrapolated the, uh, we measured the residual, which is given by the, uh, essentially by, by our electronics, is a property of our electronics. And you see here in this plot, in the bottom right, that the uh, response, the linear response of the system is at the level of electron volts in the, in the KV energy range. But more in general, we calibrated all our SDDs for uh, at that time that we installed 15 units. And we have uh, here the sum of the calibrated units. Uh, and uh, on, the, on the right, uh, the residual again of this. Uh, of this uh, the, the, of the electronics, and we uh, have for a uh, for a group as a global response uh, uh, residuals uh, within plus minus three electron volts in our range of uh, from four to uh, you know, actually fifteen keV, which means that uh, the linear response is uh, uh, the, the relative linear response is the level of ten to minus three, ten to minus four, which is very very <laughs> impressive, even in this condition. So we are not uh, at all affected by the, by the machine. And this is also demonstrated by the uh, resolution of the K alpha line of the iron with, that we took as, a, as an example, because it's the reference value for the evaluation of the resolution of all the silicon drift detectors, which is 157 we, uh, at 150 uh, Kelvin. So it's uh, completely in agreement and, and it's completely expected by this, uh, this detector. So we, uh, here we close the characterization, the, the test, actually not a characterization that we have done in this uh, heavy uh, condition. And then we also installed and tested the, the uh, luminometer, which is another fundamental tool to evaluate the quality for what we are interested for, the, of course, of the beam. And uh, uh, it worked uh, just uh, uh, also be, um, uh, prior to the to the collisions. But here I just plot uh, the really first uh, uh, collisions made by the, the Daphne Collider, and about the present status and the, all the optimization that we have done uh, uh, later will be a dedicated talk uh, of my colleague Fabrizio Napolitano. So now let's move uh, uh, to. A typical Siddhartino run in this period we are speaking about last week, you know? 
uh, in this run, what we uh, in this in this period, what we do, we at the moment evaluate uh, firstly the background of the of the machine, the response of their tuning and whatever. So we give a complete feedback and a total feedback to to the machine, as will be discussed in the last slides. Here I took a, a period of uh, uh, of smooth working in collision of by the by the collider, and this is the spectra. Here, the, um, this is the typical global spectrum collected. And here you can see clearly uh, four peaks. There is the titanium chi alpha, which is activated uh, by the, uh, the showing effect, the, the particle uh, hitting uh, on the top of the uh, target cell, the Siddhartha, the Siddhartha target, target cell. And the three peaks, uh, which are uh, the bismuth, LA, L beta, and L gamma which are all the, the possible L transition of maybe of the, the bismuth. And they, the bismuth is uh, present behind the SDD wafer, the silicon bar wafer of the, of the SDD detectors, and so, so him is activated by the, by the beams. For the rest, in the energy region that we are more interested, uh, which is from 5 to 10 keV, is uh, quite uh, clean. There, is, uh, there are no uh, spurious peaks. Uh, here in this region. So then uh, we do a cut, in this data, a very preliminary cut, uh, because we exclude the period of injection, because we have seen on the luminometer side that uh, in this period, the background uh, with respect to the counts uh, during this collision um, period is very, very higher. And also the, uh, the background is uh, uh, We cut, we cut out the injection period, and we have this, this let's say, final spectrum. In this, uh, in, with this spectrum, we estimate finally the background. So we have the integral of the events within this region. We know the active area given by the number of LTDs working. And from the luminometer, we get the integrated luminosity, of course, for, for the run. And uh, so that we estimate the background, which is in this case 14, 10 to, 10 to 4 X rays uh, for centimeter square for picobard inverse. However, let me say that this is a preliminary evaluation. In fact, we are now installing the trigger. You see clearly from the top left plot, uh, if you remember the one of the luminometer, you will see in the few. In the, few minutes also the, uh, the luminometer one, here the ratio, the separation between counts and mids is much more uh, evident, but of course it's a matter really due to the shape and the geometrical configuration. But this, uh, just to say that with the trigger, uh, we expect a background rejection factor of around 10 to minus five, because we can finally put in coincidence the, uh, trigger, signal, the, the trigger signal given by the, the count trigger, and the timing response of our SDDs. As will be discussed uh, in the next talk by Francesco, the timing, SDD, the timing response of the SDD is, can be very, very sharp. Can be, uh, it, will, it is uh, uh, almost a factor two also faster. They are also faster with respect to Siddhartha. And uh, the, cap the timing capability of our SDDs will be a fundamental tool for the background rejection. So uh, as the last uh, slide, uh, we, I, I say that uh, we are continuously working, we are continuously monitoring, monitoring the uh, BIMS parameter, the BIMS quality for what we are interested for, which are the currents, of course, uh, the rates of uh, meets and counts, and luminosity, integrated luminosity. But not only this, because uh, we also provide uh, the same data and the elaborated one to Daphne. So uh, on one side, we have the background evaluation for each run, and we give them these uh, results, which cannot be, of course, uh, uh, online, because it needs uh, some statistics to be acquired. And uh, in the other case, for a, uh, for a direct uh, feedback from Siddhartha to, uh, to, to Daphne, we provide the count rates, uh, the mid rates, and the ratio. So, uh, during this uh, uh, phase of beam commissioning uh, by the machine, uh, we are 
in synergy, we are providing uh, uh, the, the elements that they need, and at the same time, they try to tune more and more to improve the, the quality of the beam. So in conclusion, the Sidertino experimental apparatus is working, it's fully working and taking data during this phase of commissioning by the Bade Daphne Collider. In this phase, uh, we provide the, the um, we did the optimization of the SDDs and the luminosity monitor. We published also paper for, for our outcomes because they are key tools uh, during this uh, margin op machine optimization phase. And uh, uh, to, to work in synergy to help uh, this, uh, um, the, 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 this during this phase, the, the Daphne team we provide a continuous online monitoring uh, of the of the beam. Uh, and uh, lastly, when the uh, this phase will be concluded, when the background will be and the, the number of the, the luminosity and the background will be at the final stage, we will move directly to the measurement of the Siddhartha two. So to the measurement of the Kaunik duty. But that's not all, because in the meantime, we are thinking also to the future. To the future, which means the maybe uh, would mean, for example, the measurement of the 2P2NS transition con helium, with for which we need uh, uh, definitely precise uh, detectors like for uh, the uh, the X-ray spectrometer with the APG, HAPG crystals, like for boxes, or, or uh, to measure other conic atoms. Other conic atoms with transition at higher energy um, above 20, K, 20 kV, so 30, 40, 60. And to do this, uh, we are developing in this moment, uh, during this uh, day, this, um, this year, we are develop, uh, developing the uh, technology of one millimeter thick SDDs, which is uh, totally pioneering because the uh, SDDs of Siddhartha 2 and in general are maximum around uh, half a millimeter, no? So we are developing this new uh, technology. And uh, last, uh, last but not least, uh, there is also a plan for the measurement of the count mass using, uh, again, the uh, boxes, which will be, the, which will be uh, discussed by Alessandro Scordo, my colleague at 12, um, quarter past 12, or the high-purity high germanium detector. So uh, for this, uh, that's all. I think that I'm in time, and thank you. Thank you. You're perfectly in time, Marco. Uh, thank you for this overview of the present status of the uh, ac experimental activities towards Siddhartha 2. Uh, are there any questions? Just raise your hand or start speaking. I don't see any. So uh, thank you very much, Marco. Thank you. So Marco has uh, presented and spoke about uh, what it's happening and going on here with this uh, experimental activity towards Siddhartha 2, which is really a, a challenging, very challenging experiment. You have heard this word SDD, so which is our detector to measure the X-rays within our experiment. And of course, that before putting the SDDs inside Siddhartha, one needs to do a lot of work to characterize them, so to know what you already put inside. In order to do this, we have uh, performed a lot of activities, uh, even in this, let's say, hard period of uh, pandemic situation, our lab was open and operated continuously. Uh, I thank to the young people who put forward these activities and uh, as a representative of them, our new PhD student, Francesco Sgaramella, who's now in the forest or I don't know, in a cloud bubble chamber. I don't know where is yes. he is. Bubble chamber. The bubble chamber. I thought you are in the forest, but no. So he's <laughs> in the bubble chamber, sorry. He will <laughs> show us what he has been doing in the pandemic situation, how he spent his time in, uh, in our lab. So characterizing these uh, detectors, so hopefully soon we will be on the beach or in the desert looking at the sky, but for the moment we are in the lab looking at SDD detectors. 
Please, Francesco, uh, show us what, what has happened during this period. Thanks, Catalina. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes. So yes, yes. today I will talk about the SDD qualification for county items measurement performed by the Siddhartha Shoe Collaboration. The SDD is playing a um, key role in the spectroscopy experiment thanks to the energy and time resolution, low electronic noise and high rate capability. New monolithic SDD arrays have been developed by the Siddhartha Shoe Collaboration. Uh, each monolithic array is uh, 450 micron thick. This thickness um, provides high quantum efficiency for photon of energy between 4 keV and 12 keV, corresponding to the region of interest of the Siddhartha Shoe experiment. Each array consists in eight SDD units organized in a matrix with one millimeter dead region along its border. The silicon wafer is glued on a um, ceramic carrier, which provides the polarization to the single units and houses a uh, dedicated amplifier, the cube. Each cube is bonded to the corresponding SDD anode, and the device is uh, screwed on high purity aluminum uh, support, which provides the cooling, uh, the cooling power. So here I am reported a um, graphical representation of the SDDs. The single SDD unit has a cylindrical shape with a N minus silicon bulk, sided by P plus concentric rings named drift rings and a P plus layer, which forms the uniform uh, radiation window, giving a homogeneous sensitivity over the wall detector area. In the middle of the rings is located a small collecting anode. On the right, we can see um, the cross section of an SDD. The anode is located in, on the top left. And near the anode, there is a fixed negative biasing P plus ring, the ring one. The negative biasing of the P plus rings increase from the ring one to the last one, the ring N, and this is necessary to fully deplete the silicon bulk, while the opposite surface, named also back electrode, is fixed with a ratio uh, ring N and back equal to two. The dot line here indicates the diagonal shape of the potential minimum for electrons. So each electron generated inside the detector by the incoming radiation will drift to the anode while the holes are collected by the reverse bias P plus regions, so rings and back electrode. And so in general, the drift feed focus the electron to the anode. We perform a study about the SDD energy response in our laboratory in function to the drift voltage. And this study has been performed to optimize the drift pin parameters and determine the polarization voltage range within the SDD and spectroscopy property, energy resolution, linearity, and stability are the best. To study the energy response, we used a dedicated setup shown here. The SDD is placed inside an aluminum vacuum chamber above a cold finger connected to an external cryostat. A turbo molecular pump is used to generate the high vacuum up to 10 to minus seven millibar. And this is fundamental to prevent the detector surface damages during the cooling phase. The target here made of strips of titanium, iron, copper, bromine, is attached on aluminum support and placed at 45 degrees with respect to the entrance windows. The X-ray tube induces the emission of the target elements and the radiation is detected by the SDD in a reflection configuration. This is the best configuration to reduce the Bremsstrahlung background and maximize the target elements emission. 
To perform this study, we used also an external DC power supply and a voltage divider to provide the polarization voltage to the last ring and the back electrode. The signal coming from the detectors are, are elaborated by the low noise front end electronics uh, named Spera. Okay, the spectra have been acquired varying the drift voltage in the range between uh, 90 and 180 volt. The figure here shows the filter spectrum in uh, arbitrary units given by the ADC obtained at uh, 140 volt. The energy response of the device is described by a um, predominant Gaussian function for every X-ray emission peak and a low energy uh, component named tail due to the uh, incomplete charge collection events. The overall uh, fit function consists in a sum of Gaussian and tail function for each pixel and a first degree polynomial to reproduce the flat background. So the Gaussian peak position width have been extracted from the fit parameter to calculate, uh, first of all, the linearity. And about the linearity, only the K alpha peaks have been used since they have um, higher signal to background ratio with respect to the K beta peaks. The slope of the linear function corresponds to the gain of the system in terms of uh, electron volts above channels. Also, uh, the residual has been calculated to evaluate the um, linearity of our system. Here I reported the energy resolution and the calibrated position of the K uh, alpha iron peak during the stability run. The energy resolution is proportional to the square root of the energy, of course, plus a contribution due to the electronic noise. Um, regard the stability, the values are fluctuating around the reference value of the K alpha iron. So um, in this case, 140 volt, the energy response of the system is linear with a few electron volts. The energy resolution is fine and the system is stable. Uh, in this figure, the figure show the overlap of the spectra at 100, 140 and 108 volt. There are no difference as you can see in the spectra at 100 and 140 volt. Instead, at 108 volt, there is a um, consistent agreement in the amplitude of the peaks due to a uh, widening of the peaks. In the right, I plot, I reported the mean residual value in function of the drift voltage. The response of the detector is still linear with a few electron volt, but the gain of the linear function increase moving from um, 100 volt to 180 volt. And this is due to a reduced amount of charge collected to the anode. Here I bought also the energy resolution for the K alpha iron in function of the drift voltage. The worsening of the energy resolution is visible. And this is the consequence of uh, the turning effect so, so I mean, uh, the incomplete charge collection events begin all the spectra acquired in the same experimental condition, the intrinsic contribution to the energy resolution related to the statistical fluctuation or the electronic noise contribution can't explain such a change. So a third component must be considered to explain the increase of the energy resolution. This new term is due to the incomplete charge collection uh, event. And the new contribution to the resolution denotes that the incomplete charge collection is related to the voltage applied, which may move the focus or the drift field away from the anode. I'm sorry. Okay, to demonstrate this, the number of events due to the incomplete charge collection estimated via the integral of the tail function have been compared with the events due to the Gaussian peak and also simulation of the electric field potential of the charge transport inside the SDD have been performed to show how the drift path of the electron and all can change according of the applied drift voltage. 
At 100 and 140 volt, the number of events in, due to the Gaussian tail contribution is almost the same. And the ratio between the tail and Gauss events is less than 1%. And this simulation here show the equipotential line in a cross section of the SDDs from the boundary of the detector to the center of the detector. And the anode is placed here in the top right. The electric field, as you can see, focuses efficiently the electron path to the detector, both for 100 and 140 volt. On the other side, at 180 volt, the number of tail events is greater than in the previous case, option. And the tail gas events increase up to 5%. And the simulation confirms what we observed uh, experimentally. So as you can see, the electric field is unable to focus the electrons to the anode. Finally, um, the result of the analysis performed for all the spectra obtained varying the drift field are summarized in this scatter plot. Starting from lower voltages to 175 volts, the incomplete charcoal legend events uh, can be considered a minor contribution to the spectrum. Instead, at, uh, a worsening of the detector collection, collection efficiency is, is observed at 180 volts. So if the drift voltage is lower than 180 volts, the electrons are focused to the collection anode. And it has been demonstrated that the SDDs have a wide drift field operating range. And so the Siddhartha Shu SDD drift field voltage will be set in the center of this range, uh, about 140 volt. We study also the timing response of the detectors. The timing response is the time interval between the instant of charge creation and the anode complete collection. So we studied the timing response of the SDD as function of the temperature of the detectors, keeping fixed the um, drift voltage at 140 volt based on the result of the previous slide. This is the um, schematic representation of the experimental setup. The strontium source has been used to excite the target element made of uh, iron and copper. The timing information is provided by a scintillator used as trigger and the X-ray signal uh, resulting as a step on the leakage ramp of the detectors. And we used a um, three line fit procedure allowing to recover the energy and timing information for each event. For detail, if you're interested in the detail of this three line fit, please, uh, see the following article. Okay, the figure left show an example of calibrated and fit spectrum obtained during the time response run. The time analysis refers to the detected following with energy corresponding to the K alpha um, copper line within a three sigma energy selection. On the right, you can see the drift time distribution for photon associated to the selected energy region. The time resolution is extracted by the distribution of all the uh, drift time related to charges created at different positions inside the detector. So the shape of the peak is due to the geometry of the detector, while the um, flat tail distribution is due to the accidental events in coincidence with the trigger. And in order to exclude the effect of this accidental coincidence in the evaluation of the timing resolution of the detector, we perform a cut on the tail. The cut has been established such that the increment of the number of events between uh, two subsequent steps of uh, 50 nanoseconds result below 0.3%. So at the end, the timing resolution is defined from the root main square of the drift distribution. Okay, now the figure on the left compares the SDD timing distribution normalized with respect to the total number of events 
for the K alpha uh, copper line at a different temperature. The widening of the distribution is coherent with the increase of the temperature. And on the right, uh, this is the SDD timing response distribution in the range between 100 and 200 Kelvin. The data distribution is in good agreement with the equation of carrier's mobility. And the full control on timing response of the device is fundamental to perform high precision X ray spectroscopy. And for the SIDART experiment, it has been estimated a, redu a reduction of the electromagnetic background of a factor two by supplying a 400 nanosecond SDD timing windows, which correspond to a detector temperature about uh, 150 Kelvin. Completed the qualification of the SDD and established the working parameter, polarization voltage, and temperature of the SDD, uh, we started the characterization of the SDD for the SIDART short experiment. We install a new dedicated setup able to characterize a complete bus, so eight arrays at the same time. The setup consists of a um, turbo monogra pump for the high vacuum, a vacuum gauge to check the pressure, and on the top is placed uh, the X-ray tube and on the right, we can see our uh, um, front-end electronics. We uh, worked always in a reflection configuration to reduce the, big, the Bremsdrang with the background of the X-ray tube. Okay, this is, these are the detectors installed on the mounting device. Uh, there are, but are not visible, uh, two heaters placed here, and two PT-100 to control the temperature of the detectors. And this is um, an example of SDD spectrum obtained after the characterization run from the fit, from the fit parameter, we evaluate the linearity and the uh, energy resolution for each SDDs. And this is the result of a characterization one array. We can see eight working channel with the resolution for the uh, K alpha iron line. After the characterization, the array, sorry, the array is ready to be installed in the SIDARTA show setup. I conclude, and the SIDARTA collaboration performed a detailed qualification of the new monolithic signal drift detector. We demonstrate that the SDDs have a wide drift voltage working range within the energy response is linear within three electron volts. So the systematic error due to the SDD calibration is about three, volt, three electron volts. And we study also the uh, timing response of our detectors. And um, oh, sorry, we study also the energy resolution, the K alpha iron, and it's about 150 Kelvin. We verify the stability of our system. And after this, we study the timing response of our detectors. We define the ideal temperature for the SDD, uh, about 150 gammy, to which the drift time is about uh, 400 nanoseconds. And this is fundamental for a better re reaction of the, of the background with respect to the SIDARTA experiment. So I'm finished. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Francesco. So um, yeah, that was what you were doing this <laughs> during this pandemic situation. Uh, quite impressive. Um, now I want to ask if there are any sort of questions or curiosities. Raise your hand or start talking. Because what I want to underline is that all these efforts, like for example, the last one that Francesco has mentioned, namely the drift time and the regime of temperatures of the detectors to get it as small as possible, that's fundamental because the background we have in the experiments directly scales with this type of the parameter. So it's quite... Um, let's say, <laughs> important work for 
ensuring the optimal performance of the apparatus. I don't see questions. So thank you once again, uh, Francesco. Uh, we move thank then you. to the third speaker of this session, uh, Fabrizio Napolitano from Frascati, who's going to show us what is actually being done, not regarding the SDD detector, but what Daphne machine is doing, how it's producing kaons, how we measure the counts, because of course we will need to, that's our, let's say, uh, monitor for our signal. So we had to develop a method and technology to keep up with what Daphne is doing and count the counts. So Fabrizio, please, the floor, it's all yours. Thank you, Catalina. Um, do you hear me again? Yes, yes. And thank you for the invitation to this nice workshop. And so, as, as Catalina said, I, uh, I'll present some very preliminary uh, results on the uh, luminosity measurements, which we have been uh, doing uh, the start of the operation for the Siddhartha 2. And this is a, a picture I take a few days ago of the Daphne, this is the Daphne Hall. Uh, at the uh, Frascati laboratories. This on the right is actually the building where, where uh, I'm in here. This is the uh, nuclear physics building. Um, okay. Right, so, um, so as you heard from the previous talks, um, we are, are doing in the phase one, uh, which is the Siddhartino configuration. And this operates with a limited number of arrays uh, uh, which, which are one sixth of the, of the total. And uh, as you already saw this picture, uh, this plot shows the, uh, what we want to do, which is the uh, first characterization of the conic helium. And this will allow to understand and control the background on the SED and all the experimental apparatus. And later on, we will move from Siddhartino to Siddhartha II uh, for the measurement of the deuterium. And in here, we will use the full configuration of the SDDs. And this measurement actually requires a high integrated luminosity, so about 10 times what we are expected to get uh, with the Setartino C setup. And so uh, from, from this, the importance of having a precise and reliable uh, measurement of the uh, luminosity and complementary to the, the, the measurement which is done in, in, uh, in Daphne. Okay, so here on, on this slide, uh, I show what, what is the uh, actual uh, detector for configuration for these two measurements. So on the, uh, um, on, on, on the beam line, you have actually the Daphne lumino luminosity monitors. And so uh, this focus on a specific uh, physics process, which is the Baba scattering, and which is well, well known uh, standard candle, let's call it for luminosities at uh, electron positron colliders. While this is our Siddhartha, uh, Siddhartha 2 uh, luminosity monitor. And as you see from this picture, we are targeting really a different process, which is not anymore the scattering of two electron and positron, but rather the, uh, the, we are measuring the presence of the kaons from directly from the, from the feed decay. And of course, this is quite much related to the measurement of the uh, chaonic atom transition. So we really need this kind of measurement and, and hence the focus. As a side note from uh, two different approaches, you, you could also think about measuring the, this cross-section. But for the moment, we are, we are using this, this tool for uh, uh, luminosity uh, monitoring. And so this is on the bottom, <laughs> uh, a picture I took from the, uh, it's really in this, in this region of the accelerator and you can see the direction of the positron and the one of the electron. So uh, I found this uh, nice. Okay. Um, Yes, so uh, about the luminometer, uh, this has been designed and constructed in collaboration with the Jagiellonian University. And this on, 
on the left is a, um, a picture from the bottom. And this, this funny, funny shape is constrained by the actual geometrical setup. And so this is again a sketch of the uh, luminometer where the uh, plastic scintillators is, is this part here. Then there is a light guides and which connects the scintillator with the uh, photomultipliers, which are Hamamatsu type. And this was, uh, this setup was test uh, twice before the start uh, of the operations with actually a strontium 90 source. And this showed a very high efficiency, uh, but of course for uh, relatively low energy uh, beta. And the signals you actually get from the uh, uh, PMTs, they need to be, of course, uh, processed. And this we do in the uh, DIQ hardware. And so this is fairly complicated sketch. So bear with me. And you, you can also ask directly if you, uh, if you want after the after I'm done. And uh, right, so uh, basically the most important part is the the, the signals which come from the PNTs, they enter a discriminator, okay? This is a constant fraction discriminator. Uh, there has been a lot of work on here pro to properly tune the thresholds to accept the signals from the discriminator. Anyways, they're they are taking full coincidence. So for these measurements, we require that all the PNTs have seen something and they are put again in, the, in uh, together with the radio frequency. I will talk later about that uh, radio frequency, which comes directly from the uh, Dafter, Daphne Collider. And so once the uh, all the four uh, PMTs have seen uh, have seen um, signals at the same time, they also are processed in the uh, uh, accepted and processed in the uh, uh, TDC. So um, we get this fundamental quantity for luminosity measurement, which is the um, uh, timing. And also uh, in this path above, we also get the charge. For the moment, uh, we, uh, we will focus for, for this on the uh, TDC. Okay, and at this configuration, uh, we can withstand the rates uh, with the DIQ of about uh, two kilohertz, which is qu quite enough for the moment to uh, to to um, to analyze uh, to process all the data all the signals coming from the PNTs. Okay, and so I say that the uh, TDC is a fundamental quantity we we use for the for the luminosity measurement. And how do we do it? Well, this is basically a time of flight uh, measurement. And so you you see again here the picture of the uh, scintillators, the beam pipe from the bottom. And you can imagine the, Daf the Daphne bunches, they uh, come from left to right and they uh, interact roughly at the center of this, of this picture. So uh, producing the kaons, okay? So actually, uh, since the kaons are quite heavy and for sure heavier than electron and positrons, they will have a different time of flight. And in particular, this is useful if you want to divide this contribution from the kaons to the uh, beam beam and beam environment interaction, uh, which then give rise to uh, MIPS, for example, minimum, minimum ionizing particles. And to this end, we, we of course use the Daphne radio frequency. And to, due to the technical limitation of the hardware, we have to take it divided by four, but this is not uh, a showstopper. And I'll explain you how this, this is calculated then. So you can imagine this is the uh, radio frequency of the Daphne. And we want to discriminate using timing, the kaons and the MIPS. So we will put one pair of the, uh, one pair of scintillators of uh, PMTs on the X axis and one other on the Y axis, okay? Right, so the MIPS, of course, they will be in phase and perfectly overlap with one of these region uh, of the radio frequencies. The, they are traveling together with the beam. And in, the, in this plot, you will see them on this kind of uh, projected on the two axes in, in this diagonal. 
But then, of course, there is the time of flight difference, which uh, factors in as an additional uh, time, and then it will follow then consistently at the same distance from the MIPS. And if you project on the diagonal, then there will be, well, if you if you optimize your geometry and so on, which we did, they will be uh, they will fall in these uh, steps in between. And then we project uh, these uh, entries of this histogram on the diagonal, and we see this kind of uh, shape, uh, which was also shown before uh, by Marco, and. Uh, where you can clearly see where the MIPS are, where the kaons are, and this is uh, kind of a clear separation we can use. Okay, so this is the real life plot, and this is how it looks from a, a run which was taken a few days ago. This is really the plot uh, as before. So you see in these big uh, blobs are the, uh, the MIPS and the smaller one and the uh, kaons. There are, of course, some uh, unphysical uh, reflections in the in, in this uh, in this plot but they are very low in statistics so it doesn't really matter and and this on the bottom instead is the projection of the uh, diagonal and instead of my sketch here you can really see uh, between these lines these green lines the, the chaos and the, the peaks of the MIPS um, and of course you can you can count this uh, these chaos which you identify in this way uh, you can count by feet or by uh, cuts, so it doesn't really matter. And the MIPS contribution is a few percent. Um, from then, the number of chaos you can calculate the luminosity uh, by the usual formula. So you have to consider the time of the DIQ and, of course, uh, the uh, um, the cross section of electron positron going to uh, k plus k minus. Uh, which which has to be a differential cross section, and uh, this is the the results. So, so here in the top, from the same uh, period, you see the uh, currents which were in the in the Daphne collider. So in red the positron, in blue the uh, electron, and in this plot in the bottom shows the luminosity in in fa in um, uh, factor of ten to the thirty one centimeter to the minus two. A second to minus one, uh, which show which we already get quite some high uh, peak luminosity of uh, around 10, uh, which, which is already good at this stage. And one other thing which we uh, provide apart from the luminosity, which is very important for the, also very important for the Siddhartha 2 uh, experiment is a real time information we provide to uh, Daphne. Uh, so, as I said, luminosity is not all the, all the what it is, but we can also, if I go back to slide, uh, compare how much MIPS we will have as a fra in comparison to the chaos, because, of course, uh, the MIPS will also produce a background in the uh, SDTs. Okay, so, and this is the plot of the same period where you see that at the start of the fill, you have typically higher background. This is really at the ratio of chaos over MIP. And uh, and um, at the end of the well of the field, then typically you have some smoother and and better uh, uh, lower level of backgrounds. And as I said, this is provided online uh, every 15 seconds to the Daphne accelerator, and this way they can uh, tune tune their uh, their apparatus to minimize the background. So let me show you in detail uh, very preliminary uh, results we have from this. And so this on the left, you already saw, uh, this is the, the spectrum of the SEDs for a period where the integrated luminosity was 1.5 inverse pico bar. And this is a luminosity which is calculated using our luminometer. And at the same time, uh, you can also see how, how much was the background in the luminometer itself, because you can distinguish kaons and, and MIPS. In this, ca in this case, we see a ratio of MIPS over kaon of about 3.5. So how does this correlate between the two? And this is in this next slide, which you see on the x-axis, then this uh, figure of Mary, which is the integral of events in the SDDs. 
per uh, centimeter square, of course, and inverse pico bar. And this on the y-axis is the ratio of the MIPS over K on NU. You can clearly see that this is a linear dependency, so which means that the uh, luminometer is a demonstrated tool and to control and understand the beam uh, background at Daphne, and hence the importance of uh, having it shared with the, uh, with the uh, Daphne uh, staff. Okay, so this brings me uh, to the conclusions. And uh, so, as I said, the luminosity uh, monitoring is a key ingredient for the Siddhartha 2. And um, we have two sets of uh, luminos luminometers, which is the, the one from our side, from Siddhartha, <coughs> and the one from Daphne. They target two very different physics processes. And we provide this. Um, uh, this control in real time feedback to the collider. <clears throat> and so we are operating this luminometer since the start of the operations. And here on the left, on the right, you can see a plot of the integrated luminosity, which is, it, it is called being collected. So, and I want to say a big ten, thanks to the Daphne staff for, for this continuous and wonderful operation we have so far. <clears throat> and we are looking forward to higher luminosities. So unfortunately, my, my voice is going out, but luckily I'm done. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Fabrizio. Why is your voice going down? Have you seen too much these days? <laughs> yeah, too much singing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Fabrizio. So you have seen how, how we are measuring uh, the luminosity with our detector which by the way it's quite different because Daphne has another one but which is actually relying on Baba scattering so Baba scattering has nothing to do with scans in a first sense which means that it's very relevant to really count the count and uh, what we have in plan actually in a short time it's also to do a scanning energy and to check we are really really on the top of the phi production for for the counts and uh, are there questions curiosities or any sort of observation comment i don't see so thank you fabrizio that uh, for for this uh, nice uh, presentation and now we move to, let's say, uh, for future perspectives. So we move on from the present and uh, showing you how we optimize our tools to do these measurements to what could be a future, both at uh, Daphne as well as um, uh, maybe other, other facilities like, like JPAR. And we have two talks in this uh, line which are going to show quite different detector systems for ultra, ultra high precision measurements. And I invite the first of the two speakers, Dr. Alessandro Scordo from Frascati, who is uh, going to show us how a spectrometer of a new generation using new types of crystal, it's being uh, by, by him um, set up and so I see that you, Alessandro, are in Japan. I see behind you some Japanese. Uh, you are muted, by the way. I know, I know. Now I, I, I'm mute. Okay, so from Japan, <laughs> Alessandro Scordo. <laughs> okay. okay, so... As Catalina was introducing, I am going to present you uh, some, I would say, a bit technical details of these um, new mosaic crystal spectrometers. Uh, I, I decided to, to put some slides, not technical, with, with very technical details, but with uh, uh, extended details of what we did and what we have under control, because I think this is uh, one of the main aspects uh, for future application. And just let me start from what we heard about conic atoms in these days. Um, just these are the very latest results that we had in Siddhartha. 
this is just one slide summarizing them all. You can see here conic helium and hydrogen and also the foreseen measurement of conic deuterium in which the, the common ground, as you can see, is that for the conic helium measurement, you have uh, statistical precision, which can arrive at some electron volts. And also, um, the, the, uh, in the case of conic hydrogen and deuterium, uh, they are quite bigger. And this is due, uh, as you probably well know, to the fact that uh, um, we are already basically at the limit that is given by the Fano factor for the resolution of solid state detectors, which means that precisions of 1 to 50 electron volt, more or less, depending on the statistics, can be reached with the present detector full without maximum values. But as you know, these values are not enough for many other measurements. I just put here some examples. The first one that came to my mind is that, for example, for the chaotic helium that we measured in Siddharth and we published, the, pub the published value of the width of the transitions are these ones that you can see here, which basically are compatible with zero, but also with more than 20 somehow. And this is, of course, due to the poor a poor resolution that was achieved that with that detectors. And other examples are, for, are uh, the current mass measurement, as was suggested by Dr. Claude Amser and Simon Edelman, to be important not only for the, the current physics itself, but also for the physics, for example, and that can only be achieved with much higher precisions. And also, as suggested, for example, by Professor Witzig about the possibility to, to obtain information for example, on the Randa 1405, by measuring upper levels, me uh, upper levels uh, which have very small uh, width value. And also, I was thinking about the possibility to measure um, fine splitting, let's say, of, co of conic atoms levels, which could be very nice to be obtained for having hints of cascade processes. So uh, if one wants to get rid of solid state detector, standard solid state detector, one of the natural candidates is Bragg spectroscopy that you know very well, probably, which tells you that if you have some X-rays or photons in the X-ray range, which are impinging on a crystal, they are reflected following this rule here. I don't know if you see the mouse. And in this way, if you put a, det a position detector at the end of the line, you can really see a nice energy spectrum. Uh, full width of 1 to 10 electron volt can be achieved with this kind of technique, depending on the quality of the crystals and on the dimension of the detector. And also a very nice feature is a sort of natural background reduction, which comes from the geometry, because you see that the, the detector is usually put not in direct line to the beam. But of course, there are a lot of drawbacks. First of all, the very small solid angles that can be covered, which leads to efficiencies, which are as low as 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 8 for the typical spectrometers. And that the crystals which are used uh, typically are silicon or quartz, and they have a, a lattice contents, which makes them useful for energy up to 6, 7 kV, not much higher. And of course, that you need to work with source size of typically 10 to 100 microns. And you can, as you can see here, this is just a two or three extracts from some papers you can find in literatures. So what we tried to do in Frascati with the Vox's collaboration is to try to see if the realization of mosaic crystal, which is uh, recent, let's say, of some tens of years now, can be used for improved uh, this technique for conic atoms measurement. In particular, thanks to mosaic crystals, we can improve, for example, starting with the efficiency. And the efficiency is improved because of mosaicity, which means that these crystals are not monoblock crystals, but they are composed of many small crystallites inside, which are a bit misoriented. And in this way, if you have photons which are reaching the crystal with uh, a Bragg angle, which is not exactly matching the, the nominal one, they can be anyway reflected thanks to the small misalignment of these crystals. And this can lead to an increase in the reflection efficiency up to a factor 50, more or less, of course, with a drawback of a small factor of loss in resolution. 
Another very important point is that this mosaic crystal that we want to use are made of graphite, pyrolytic graphite, which has a, a lattice constant of 3.3 angstrom, which is almost half of the silicon one, which means that we can, they can be easily used up to 20 kV, more or less, in the n equal 1 reflection uh, range. Uh, this can be also, they, they have also other very nice uh, technical features. I don't want to go very much into details now. But the main message here is, the, is that thanks to this mosaic crystal, we can really reduce, uh, we can really improve the reflection efficiency of a factor of almost 50. Then uh, the other important feature of these crystals is that they are grown somehow. They, and, and so this means that they can be grown on, on top of whatever surface you like. And for example, of course, uh, they can be grown on top of cylinders, which means that they are the best candidate to be used in von Hammer's configuration. Why is this is so important? Because von Hammer's configuration lets you not only enhance the features which comes from the mosaicity, but also lets you improve your collection efficiency by exploiting the focusing, the vertical focusing of, bent, of cylindrically bent crystal on the, on the final position detector. And there are several measurements already published which are saying that the resolution of bent uh, crystals with respect to flat ones is not changing. And so we are also able to exploit now the vertical dimension of your target because as soon as the, the image of what you use as target is arriving on the useful surface of your crystal, this is reflected and refocused again on your system, which means that you can really use here targets up to millimeter or centimeters in vertical. Of course, the other important point is to enlarge the dimension of the source size in the Bragg plane, which is the main challenging parameter to be changed. And what we did in our collaboration is to see uh, if it was possible to imagine a sort of new geometry where the point-like source or the very small source that you need to use Bragg spectrometers could be somehow overcome by means of a new geometry. And we realized that we can exploit a pair of slits in order to produce somehow a projection of the X ray fluorescence beam coming from the source, having a, a virtual point-like source in the middle here and also to have here an enlarged effective source size uh, on our target. And of course, this what, ha what happens if you do this is that somehow we are, you are, of course, increasing the, the dimension of your source size, which means that you are increasing the statistics that you can collect. But on the other side, of course, you are also worsening a bit your resolution because what happens is that you have photons which are produced in different positions of your target, which are arriving with the correct Bragg angles, and this uh, will create a sort of mega. So the main question was, how big can we use, can, we, can a source be um, in order to increase the statistics, but keeping the full width at maximum, let's say, below 10 electron volt. This is a sketch of the setup we have in our laboratory. Uh, here you see a sketch just to see the dimension, which are these two, these are the two main parameters. This is the distance between the target and the crystal and also between the crystal and the detector. And this is instead the, the, the other path, which once you select the, the radius of curvature of your, of your crystal for each energy, this is basically fixed. Uh, this is a rendering, a 3D rendering of our setup now where we have an X-ray tube which is shining on top of this box where inside here there is the target, whatever target you would like to have. And then you have the slits, the crystal and the position detector and this is a sort of drawing of the reflected X-ray fluorescence beam. I just arrived immediately to the main results that we obtained which are very promising I would say because we, are, we were able to obtain resolution, as you see, in the order of sigma of 3, 4 electron volt, which, which means that the full width of maximum is still below uh, 10 electron volts, uh, using uh, some uh, source size, effective source size, which are named here as 0 prime, as well as 0 0.8 and 1.1 millimeters, which is already an order of magnitude higher than the standard ones, which are usually used for Bragg spectrometers. And also, what the other nice feature is that if you look here, we did a scan of all the possible combination of 
source sizes and angular acceptance. And, and, and what comes out of this, we are always able to find the minimum in the precision that you can obtain. Of course, all these measurements are done exactly the same condition, so with the same integration time, which means that you can really optimize your spectrometer in order to improve the precision that you can obtain. And this is valid and tested for all energy, let's say between 6 and 20 kb. Uh, we also obtain some other nice plots because usually when you want to deal with black spectrometers, you have to uh, do a scan, in an angular scan. So you move your crystal in order to, to take different points. But with phonamo spectrometers, instead, you can do a spectra of uh, even 1 kb of dynamic range in one shot, keeping the resolution still at very nice level, also for energies up to 20 kV, more or less. And this is also a very nice feature that can be exploited in future. And in this case here, the dimension of this effective source size on the black plane is even in almost two millimeters. We uh, did a lot of work also in order to be sure that we were correctly describing the peak shape, because this, of course, if you, if you want to measure line widths, is also very important. And also, as you will see later, if you want to, do, to be able to, to perform a nice calibration with low systematic errors. So we did some different attempts to fit with Lorentzian, Gaussian, void fit, and so on and so forth. And we even uh, use some um, information criteria technique to disentangle among all these uh, models, because of course, if you change model, you are changing also the uh, degrees of freedom, and if you are not sure that only with chi square you can understand which is the best one. Uh, if you have, if you want to have more details about that, then I will remind you to our more important papers where all these are very well described. Also, we did a lot of work in order to uh, test the energy calibration procedure. Uh, here you see a sketch because with respect to the standard von Amos configuration, we are also rotating our um, position detector in order to match to be placed in front of the X-ray fluorescence beam reflected by the crystal. And this means that you need a sort of a bit uh, more complicated calibration, which also has been published and has been uh, proved to be uh, very solid. So we are also uh, happy about that. And, and as you can see here, you can calibrate using uh, either um, a polynomial function or using uh, this um, formula here, using the, the, the sinus of theta and, and, and uh, the theta Bragg angle. We also had a very deep, the detailed uh, analysis on the characteristics of the crystals and, and how they influence the final resolution in this slide here, you see how the mosaic spread is influencing the resolution. Uh, here also we have a nice paper published about that, which explains also because usually uh, higher mosaicity means that you are uh, always obtaining higher statistics and lower resolution. But for example, in our case, if you really have to look at two lines which are not too far away in the Bragg angle, we find out that this is useless to, to, to increase the mosaic spread because you are not actually exploiting all the mosaic spread. And so you are just losing resolution with no gain in statistics. And that was very important to be understood for us for future application also. And we also had a look on how the thickness of the mosaic of crystals is worsening the resolution and enlarging the statistic because of course, if you have a thick crystal, you can have a higher probability that when a photon penetrates into this thickness, uh, it, uh, it, it can find a properly oriented mono, mini crystallite to be reflected. But this, of course, also creates a broadening resolution due to misalignment. And what we find out is that even if this is true, in our case, the main dominant effect in worsening the resolution is still the dimension of the source sites. So the, the, the broadening resolution, which is brought by the thickness of the, of the mosaic crystals is negligible, which means that you can use quite thick crystals, improving statistics without losing too much resolution. And then we also measured reflection efficiencies. Here I won't give you very much details. And we have a paper which is uh, almost done, almost ready to be submitted for publication. 
And, but this is, uh, these are the numbers. Basically, this is telling you uh, the percentage of the, of the photons which are arriving onto your crystal with respect to the one which are reflected. Sorry, the vice versa, of course. And uh, with this value, you can really start to think about possible future application, also taking what, into account um, Monte Carlo simulation that I will show in the next slides. This is just a summary of what we obtained as a result. Um, and, we, and the main message here is that you see that the, the sigma of our peak is always in the range of few electron volts, while the precision that we can get, which are this delta on k alpha 1 and k alpha 2, are always well below. As I said, we had to perform, of course, Monte Carlo simulation, in particular ray tracing simulation, because when you want to design a new measurement, a new experiment using this kind of crystals, you have to use, of course, Monte Carlo simulation, but you have to be sure that they are reliable. So uh, what we did is first to, to, to use Monte Carlo simulation to see if we were really able to reproduce the final spectrum. Um, also in terms of, re of resolution and peak precision. And we had to take into account also different uh, starting X-ray fluorescence spectrum, for example, for copper. And we decided to take those which are published in this paper here. So this is the Monte Carlo input we used as an X-ray source, and this is what we obtained. And the peak position and the sigma are well reproduced. So this is a simulated one, and this is the measured one. And also, we had to uh, be sure that what we were, let's say, stating as uh, uh, effective source size and beam dimension along the beam path was true. Because uh, in Monte Carlo, in, in ray tracing simulation, what you use, usually do is that you design a, a, a target which can be as big as you want. And then you put the slits and the crystal. And then you have to retrace them back in order to see the ones which survived, so at the end, the one which were able to pass through the slits and arrive to the crystal, uh, from which portion of your target are really coming. And this is what we define as effective source. And if you see here, the effective, these are just some plots. So the effective source size are here, for example, this case is uh, uh, almost 1.1 millimeter in this dimension. And in vertical is even more than eight millimeters, more or less. And these are other nice uh, shots, uh, plots that you can obtain with ray tracing simulation. Here you can easily even see the bending of the crystal. And here you can see already the two um, uh, region of K alpha 1 and K alpha 2 on the, the street position detector position. Also, we checked the, uh, the reflection efficiency using Monte Carlo simulation, and this is what we obtained. So again, here on the top sides, you, in the top parts, you see the reflection efficiency. And here you have the relative uh, difference between the experimental one and the simulated ones, which, as you can see, within the errors, are very well reproduced. So this is a very important for us because it means that we can rely on solid simulation for future uh, design of setup. So this let me come to what we would like to do in the future, what we could do in principle with this spectrometer, you can measure a lot of conic uh, transition. This is just a list with some examples that we proposed to the NFN management in, some, uh, in the seminar that many of you uh, know and attended to. And the expected impact of force is that it could be used for, as we said, car mass measurements, cascade processes. But we were also told that this could have nice impacts on dark matter search um, using exotic atoms in space. In principle, this could we can investigate if we this could be used to prop, to, to solve the proton radius puzzle, but this is very far away to be understood yet. And also, as I said before, to measure um, the width of upper levels. Of course, uh, the detector key points is that this is can be tuned in, in an energy range between two and twenty kV. I only shown results to six to twenty because in order to go below six, you have to work in vacuum. This is what we did not. We didn't in our lab, but of course, for future experiments, it can be done. And we have extremely high resolution and, and low background after shielding. And concerning visibility, we already have very nice results. We have most of the, of the parameter understood and under control, and we have consistent ray tracing simulations available. 
So what could be a possible preliminary run is the one that you see here sketched, where we have the uh, Siddhartha setup, uh, where, uh, which you know is mounted now on Daphne, and where we can think of putting aside the Vox spectrometer that we have already in our lab. Um, basically, we have everything. What is all, all, only what is missing is a bit of shielding around the detector here, and also the, the solid table, which you see below. And just by using the simulation that I told you before and, and ass assuming some numbers that we can recoil from the Siddhartha 1 run, we can more or less expect to have in 40 days, so with 400 immersed picoban, uh, 50 total events of conic carbon, for example, of the line which is around 8 kV, 10 kV, uh, which means that based on, this, on the resolutions that we had with copper, you can expect to have precision in the, in the order of 0 0.5, 0 0.6 electron volts, so well below one. And if we imagine to, in, to enlarge these measurements to much higher statistics, we can even go below. Uh, we are always already thinking about the po a possible completely new experiment to be designed, uh, thought, and realized. Uh, using not only a single arm of this detector, but imagine to have a cylindrical target surrounding the Daphne beam pipe with gaseous targets, for example, and to have different arms of this spectrometer. In this mm, sketch here, you can see even up to eight different spectrometer arms, each of, one, uh, each of uh, which can be uh, tuned on a particular energy range. Uh, and that can be even used in trigger mode if you insert here before the target cell some, for example, trigger layer with scintillators and CPMs. And this would be a very nice opportunity. Of course, if you have a, a data dedicated experiment, you can ask for more statistics and more integrated luminosity. And this may really lead to uh, measurements with 0 0.1 electron volt precision or even below. And this leads to my conclusions. So um, periodic graphite-based Bragg spectrometers really represent a concrete possibility for future sub-electron volt precision measurements of tonic atoms transition. And we, uh, in Frascati, developed a version of such a spectrometer that can be used also with sources up to millimeters or even centimeter dimensions. Uh, we already have perform a detailed investigation and optimization of all the crystal parameters, the calibration procedure, the peak shape description. And, and this is very important because you have to, kept all, to keep all these parameters under control when you will perform future measurements. The obtained results are very promising because we already obtained resolution below one electron volt, sorry, um, precision and resolution below one electron volt and 10 electron volt respectively. And we proved already to have a solid set of Monte Carlo ray tracing simulation uh, done and perfectly matching the data. And all these ingredients really represent a fundamental starting point for our future applications. And with the first preliminary test and also with an expanded uh, ad hoc setup, Vox spectrometer has been included in the proposal for future experiments to be carried on at Daphne after Siddhartha 2, which you can find on, on this archive paper, which you uh, probably know. So this was my last slides. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, I'm here. Thank you very much, Alessandro, for this uh, overview of activity which was lasted some years, which brought to this uh, very, very uh, interesting and promising results for future measurements of extreme precisions. And um, yeah, so um, are there questions, observations, curiosities to be asked to our speaker? Uh, raise your hand or start speaking. I don't see questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Alessandro. Thank you once again. We arrived at the last speaker of this uh, STRAN workshop, uh, Dr. Shinji Okada from Chubu University in Japan, 
who is going to speak about a similar type of precision as the speaker before, but with a completely, completely different detector. So I see the slides are already shared. So Shinji, uh, please, the floor, it's yours. Thank oh, the file disappeared. Ah, sorry, yep, hi. <laughs> Ah, Hello. Okay. Hello. Yes. Well. Nice um, to see you. Nice to see you. Yep. Okay. Can you see my slide? Yes, we perfectly can see your slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank to uh, you. So thank you. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Katarina. So I'm really pleased to uh, talk about the very uh, our nearly final result of the JPAC E62 experiment, which is the precision spectroscopy of the Kaonic atom, actually Kaonic helium-3 and Kaonic helium-4 atom X-rays using the Nobel uh, cryogenic detector, so-called the TES microcalimeter. It has a great energy resolution compared, compared to the conventional uh, semiconductor detectors. <coughs> Okay, so so this is a collaboration list. So uh, the uh, we have we have uh, nearly seventy collaborators in total. Um, of course, the nuclear physicists from Japan, also the Italy, Austria, and many uh, countries, and also we have many TES the detector experts from US and also the astrophysicist who has uh, interested in this detectors. So we have big collaboration like this. And this is the, the collaboration list. Okay, so, so uh, this is the content. So after the interaction, I will briefly uh, introduce the, our superconductive detectors and then show you the the nearly final result of this experiment. Okay, mm -hmm. so I don't need to uh, explain this, but okay, so we just uh, extract the strong interaction information of the K on the nucleus <coughs> by measuring the X rays uh, and this, uh, okay, the chemic X rays. Okay, then uh, as we learned from the previous many speakers, uh, we, we can extract the K bar and uh, scattering lengths by measuring the chemical hydrogen and deuterium X rays, like this. But in the case of the heavier chemical uh, atoms, uh, we can also extract the optical potential, like this. And then from the uh, from the theoretical analysis using the many chemical uh, atoms, like this. Uh, we learned the the you know the global repulsion from the uh, large imaginary parts. So this was resulting the uh, the attractive optical potential. Then so so what about the chemical helium case? So we had some uh, the, the, the old the chemical uh, helium puzzle. So previously we had very large. Uh, the shift, but uh, in recent measurement in KK and Shidaka, uh, we almost sure about okay less than the shift is less than five EV or the width is uh, less than twenty EV or something. But uh, still, the question of because the precision is two electron volt, but we are using the energy resolution uh, the using the detector having the energy resistance about 150 EV or something like that. So then uh, this is the theoretical values of the chemical helium case. And this, this shows the, uh, the Akashi-san prediction and this Yamagata-san and Hienzaki-san calculation and also the Friedman's calculations like this. Then we have still uh, the questions, but is there the large shifts like more than one EV or something or the width like this? 
So if yes, of course, the, the, the optical potential melts you cannot explain. And also, you can also measure the, you know, the shift, uh, sign of the shift. So uh, attract shift would suggest the no P web nuclear balances or something like that. So, but uh, to, uh, to know, uh, to, to make sure about this, we, we need to, uh, we need more, uh, one order better resolution like this. <clears throat> so, but of course we need the high resolution uh, detectors and also having the large detection areas. So to, to do this experiment, we, we will use, we have used the, the superconductive detectors. Okay, so what is this TES microcalimeter? So if the particle, so the X-ray is just absorbed by the absorber, then we will measure, okay, just we will measure the temperature rise using the very high sensitive sensitivity uh, temperature sensor, so-called transition energy sensor. So this shows the TES. Then uh, we just operated at the this edge of the transition, uh, the superconducting transition. <clears throat> it's about uh, 100 millikelvin or something. Then you have, if, if we have the tiny temperature rise, then the, we have rapid, increase in resistance. So this will result in the very high energy resolution, something like the 5 EV FWHM in the 6 KB X-rays. And also we have reasonable uh, dynamic, dynamic range from four to 15 or something like that, KV. Okay, but uh, of course we need uh, the, uh, we need to cool down the something like the 70 millikelvin. So for this, we we have used this adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator, so called the T D uh, ADR, <coughs> like this. And that this uh, system is relatively compact, like this size. And then uh, at the end of uh, this uh, this nut we have this small chip like this. <clears throat> um, okay, of course uh, this uh, the pix one pix is very small, something like uh, uh, three hundred times three hundred uh, square micrometer, so one point one uh, square millimeter or something like that for one pixel. But uh, we have two hundred forty pixels, so in total we have twenty. Uh, square millimeter effective error. Uh, the the size is like uh, the this size is like uh, one centimeter, five centimeter. Okay, uh, but using even using such kind of detector, the typical keonic atom X-ray rate is about one count per hour per array. Array means this this uh, system, so it is quite slow intensity. Okay, so the requirement is like this. The statistics to get the nearly about 0 0.1 and 0 0.2 EV, uh, the uh, center of the dimension of the, the center peak, then we will, uh, we need the statistics about the 200 counts per, uh, to, to like this statistics. Uh, with this energy resolution. But as you know, the 200 counts per week is very low. <clears throat> but, and also in uh, the, the situation is very bad because the large background from the charge particle. So uh, this is the, some issue and cause and solution summarized. So we have the poor, uh, SB ratio, but we, we have the timing uh, uh, cut by, by, by just selecting the can stop events. Then this will help a lot of the, this uh, uh, SB ratio. And also we, I will explain later on about this cross stop cut. 
And uh, of course, uh, due to this charged particle hits, the energy relation is deteriorated. So uh, we just installed the lead sheet around the, this, this detector. This will help a lot about to, to avoid the direct hit of the beam uh, background. And also, we need to operate this system for one month, very stably. So long-term stability should uh, be important. Um, but uh, we just uh, do this uh, in situ uh, energy calibration using X-ray generator. Okay. So I will explain about this experiment. <clears throat> so this experiment was done by the at the uh, K one point eight PR beam line, uh, the same as the the uh, fifteen and thirty one. Oh, okay. Then, okay, this is the setup of the experiment. So K on beam is coming like this, and we have the many uh, deg degraders to stop the K on at the center of the target. Then uh, we have big uh, leak helmet target system here, and also the TS system. And have another X-ray generator here. Okay, so this is cross up view. Uh, the K is coming here. The, the the liquid helium target is set on here. Then uh, TS is just uh, pressed here and then measure the X-ray. And also we install the X-ray generator just in front of this uh, TS system. Then uh, we constantly uh, just uh, shining the the calibration. X-ray to the TS, and we have also the STD system here. Okay, this is the target cell. Uh, the the size is 400 milliliter. It's quite a lot. And then, okay, we have of course the shield, uh, uh, super insulator, something something like this. Okay. So this is the, just a photo from the, okay. Uh, the, we have many lead bricks just here to, to just to avoid the direct hit, the child particle hit to the TES. Okay, so I will show you the, the results. <clears throat> First, the, this, this shows just the, the operation of the, the cryogenic systems. The upper shows the, uh, Helium target and lower is the uh, TS uh, cryogenic. So we have just performed the um, the liquid helium refilling for the target for the target uh, just uh, for each each day, and also we need to magnet cycle to to just uh, to keep the seventy mil Kelvin once a day. So we just uh, coincidence, we have this coincidence to the, uh, for the operation. So this is just four months operation for this, uh, the cryogenic systems. Okay. Then uh, this shows the in-beam energy calibration uh, uh, spectrum. Okay, we have, uh, so the x ray tube was always on during the uh, the experiments, and then we we just used the secondary uh, X ray target, the copper, chrome, and the, the cobalt. So our interest region is about for can helium three and can form four here. So we just uh, then we, we just use this. Uh, six line for, for the calibration. And the, we just used the spline interpolation like this. Okay, then uh, that calibration was done by just one by one, uh, about two hours for it. Then uh, pixel, yeah, of course the pixel, pixel by pixel calibration. 
Okay, and then uh, detector response is very well uh, described with this uh, uh, the so the Gaussian and also the low energy exponential term like this. <clears throat> then uh, uh, this was the geometrical map of the resolution. <clears throat> um, okay, uh, we have some. Uh, uh, so no box here. This one is, is that doesn't work, but it's about uh, twelve pixels out of the two hundred forty pixels. Okay, so I'll explain about the charged particle hit background. <clears throat> okay, so if the charged particle is hit on the detector pixel like this, then uh, it deposit about 10 kb energy. So this means uh, our interest region, so which uh, uh, yeah, become the severe background in the, in the peak region. But also uh, this particle uh, just penetrates the, the, this uh, detector, then uh, just hit the silicon sub substrate here like this. So this is the TES and also this is, these are the some uh, silicon substrate. So then the heat will spread out the throughout the array, <clears throat> then make the small bump signal in many pixels. So uh, this is this just shows the some typical uh, distribution pass height. Then so this one shows just the particle hit at here. Then uh, many pixels something uh, small bump. Uh, is appeared like this. <clears throat> then, uh, okay, this is just a big typical uh, pulse shape of the X-ray heat case and the charged particle heat case. The, the okay, the blue one shows the X-rays. So then uh, these four, uh, uh, the spectrum shows the these neighboring pixels uh, pulses. <laughs> then <clears throat> in the case of the X-ray, so we have more or less no, no uh, bump, but in the case of the charged particle heat, we have some like this bump. So we can use this information to eliminate the charged part, light to charged particle heat. So this, uh, this is very work well to reduce the uh, background to get the, uh, the better SN ratio. Okay, so this is the preliminary result of the time and time versus energy <clears throat> for each helium three and the helium four target. Um, we have, okay, this is the timing and energies. And um, we have some locus around our interest region. Then uh, the time resolution also shows the very good uh, resolution about five or six nanosec FWH. And we just cut with uh, timing cut at around here. <clears throat> okay. okay, this shows the background resolution uh, that if we have no cut, then this, this block uh, histram. And then, uh, with this timing cut, we have the you know the small speaker here, and then using the thermal cross top cut, then better SNH will obtain. And then okay, this, this was just a very uh, preliminary uh, uh, analysis result. And then finally, we just uh, obtain the nearly final spectrum like this. So the Upper one is the can helium three case and can helium four case. And the lower is the helium four case. And then uh, the clear peak, the very sharp peak it's around here and here. Then uh, you can also see the asynchronous background contribution with this uh, orange histogram. 
and you can see very small uh, in the case of uh, for, for the for this peak. So this is very uh, just negligible. So this means uh, most of the background come from the the stopped K on absorption. Okay. So we just fitted the the peak and with this fourth function and low energy tail and background with this uh, condition, and the finally we obtained these values. Okay. So comparing the previous expenses, you know the energy relations quite good, and then uh, this shows about it's nearly yeah. Uh, like zero, and then okay, energy energy resolution is uh, two hundred and uh, twenty five times higher than the previous, and also the ten times better uh, precision for shift and base. Okay, then this shows the comparison with the recent theoretical calculation uh, from the Yamagata san and Hirenjak san also the Friedman. This, so now we we just our result is comparable with to the values based on the optical potentials like this. <clears throat> then this shows almost zero or slightly attractive shift in the case of the in heading four. So this will this might support the no p well nuclear state or something like that no. but now uh just we are just to finalize, finalize this uh, result uh, result and then uh almost yeah just preparing the uh the final paper okay then uh outlook of about the, the ts <clears throat> so the pre present system is applicable up to uh, 15 kV. So this is just limited by the PS saturation uh, with this uh, four micron thick bismuth absorber. So this way can be used for maybe the light uh, chaotic atoms, for example, the, the, the lithium and also the chaotic mass measurement. And also uh, we are just uh, developing another uh, DS detector uh, for 100 kV region. <clears throat> And this can be used for, of course, more, yeah, for example, the upper level of the higher, uh, high Z uh, chaotic mass, uh, chaotic atom, or of course, uh, going to the psi atoms or something like that. Okay, then, uh, okay, this is the, the plan of our, uh, the is development. So present one is this. So saturation is about 20 kV or something like that. Then uh, first, now we are just developing. So this will be available maybe the end of this fiscal year or the next year. So this, this, uh, this will be available until well, uh, 150 kV or something. And then uh, also we are just developing another one for the measurement of the about the 50 kV X-rays. Okay, so let me summarize my talk. So the physics data taking was completed in 2018. <clears throat> then we I just showed the the preliminary results. So the with this uh, cryogenic detectors, so yeah, uh, yeah, we just measure this chaotic uh, heading four and three uh, spectrum. Then, uh, okay, this shows a large shift and width are ex excluded. And then, yeah, uh, attract the shift on uh, heading uh, chaotic heading four. <clears throat> And uh, the the and the shift is less than one eV, and this width also less than five eV. Okay, then now I just final finalize this uh, analysis, and then publication will come soon. <clears throat> then to look, 
So now we just uh, the, the new project, the Munich atom experiment, following this uh, Kernic atom experiment is launched. Then within this uh, uh, framework, we just uh, developing this uh, new TS system. So this will be also available for future Hadron atom experiments. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Shinji, for this very, very interesting and instructive talk showing the capacity of these detectors to perform very well for high, high precision measurements of exotic atom transitions. Uh, now I open the discussion. So if there are questions, remarks, also in the view of results, Shinji has been shown, uh, which are going to pop to be published recently or suggestions from um, theoreticians, that's the right moment to ask or to make your Shinji, let me ask you, what is your the the major source of background of systematic error? Ah, okay. So this is just the budget of the you know the student cares. So the 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 largest one is from the energy calibration. Yes. So absolute energy calibration. Um. Yes. So actually, the our system statistic error is. Okay, this should, the can carry three case and carry four case here, yeah? but the system case takes is uh, just less than the you know uh, statistics. So now it should be okay. Yeah, but you know the the calibration error is very large comparing another another. Um, sure. Um, Yep. Thank you very much. I see there is uh, there are two questions. One from Professor Vitzek. So please, mm -hmm. Slavik. Uh, I want to raise uh, two political questions. One is that I wish to congratulate both uh, European at Siddhartha and, and Japanese team for bringing this physics to high precision region. And okay. that uh, raises another question. Is the theory prepared for such precise measurements? And uh, that is really a political question because there are groups of nuclear physicists who managed to study fairly precisely few nucleon problems. And they go up to say five bodies now and with the sort of Fadiev uh, technique or to higher number of nucleons. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, myself, I we, we have a group like that in Wars in Krakow. And myself, I tried to attract them to mesen few body systems. And mm -hmm. that never worked out. But Alexandre Obertelli was successful. With the Puma experiment, he, so to say, attracted to few body nuclear physicists. Uh, Rimanas, uh, uh, Lazauskas, and Jaume Carbonel, who are going to study five body systems. Mm -hmm. uh, that is alpha particles and antiproton in atomic states, and mm -hmm. alpha particles and the deuteron and antiprotons in atomic states. And I hope that those people could be persuaded to, to study few body physics also with k mesons, which is, mm. which is a bit easier than antiprotons. Yeah. And uh, me, myself, of course, we have a method to, to, to handle few 
nuclear chaos just by summing the uh, multiple scattering uh, systems. And we intend to, to try to extract lambda 1405 in this way. But yeah. it, it would be very valuable if, if we have just exact or, or better few body calculations to, to calibrate our conversions. Of course, we have Nina Shevchenko in the family, and that's mm -hmm. fine. She is, I understand now, in the four body systems, which is, so to say, halfway, uh, almost all the way that nuclear physicists do. So myself, I, I would be optimistic that if we have, if theorists would have these, this very precise data, they could cope with it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you very much for the comment. Yeah, very, yeah. It's uh, nice to have <laughs> such kind of curiosity. Yeah, for future. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Mm. So that, that's a proper stand up for getting more work done in a collaboration between theory and experiment now that it's proved feasibility of such high precision measurements. I have seen also Maza rising hand. Yes. Well, actually, the, uh, my, my question or comment is same as uh, Professor Vizek. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Once uh, Shinji uh, mentioned about uh, uh, because of this atomic uh, data, uh, there will be no chaotic nuclear bound state in P wave. Well. If, uh, if, <laughs> <laughs> if uh, Severus, I'd like to hear what Severus will say about it. There, there is no uh, P, uh, the excited state. Uh, in P wave, and uh, like uh, Alessandro also needs some uh, theoretical input for to pin down the chaotic uh, mass for uh, uh, to um, evaluate how much uh, the electron defeating effect or uh, how to select the best target mm -hmm. to measure. So. Uh, those kind of uh, cascade calculation we need, I guess, from well, but about about the electron field that that uh, effect will be very small, of course, uh, from the coefficient calculation. No, no, no. I, I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not talking about your experiment, but the, ah, okay, the, oh, for the of course, yes, yeah, okay, the, the yeah. Alessandro's uh, uh, <laughs> what it would be, yeah. Yeah, the, yours. Yeah, so for 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 the uh, chaotic, uh, no, the chaotic mass experiment. Yeah, it is very important to have the, the gas target to el eliminate about the electron feeding. Yes, of course. Yes. yes. Yeah, actually related to this, uh, Maza, I, I jump into the discussion to tell that we are also in contact with uh, Paul Indelicato, who is uh, performing uh, very high precision calculations of cascades, of course, taking into account only QED, <laughs> mm -hmm. but uh, that's what needs when it's measuring the Cowan mass eventually. Uh, Slavik, you are still having your hand raised. Yeah, yeah I, I wanted to, to comment on Masa Iwasaki question. Uh, if you have a level shift, the relation of quasi-bound state is uh, clear. First, if the level shift is very large, uh, which tells you that the quasi-bound state would be very close to the threshold, very loosely. Now, if you have, for example, deeply bound helium for antiprotonic state or deeply bound kaon helium for, it may be really very far away from the threshold. And then the relation between the level shift and the and the quasi-bound state, especially in the case when you have large absorption, is 
not very transparent. So you might be right, but I would say it is not a definite conclusion. Uh, of course, it is likely that this state may not be exist there, but uh, uh, that re requires better checking, I would say. Yeah, thank you.